Thanks, Paul and Jackie. Uh, we love your enthusiasm and all that you're putting in. Uh, I want to introduce Andrew to those that don't know him. Uh, Andrew and Dan and Esther are with us tonight. Uh, we've become great friends. And the scripture says in Psalm 133 that the Lord blesses those people that walk together in unity. And I admit tonight that I'm wearing a red shirt. It's not when I wear red shirts. Uh, but because Andrew is online tonight, uh, I decided to wear a shirt that replicates the football club that he loves. Uh, so I wanted to do that as a sense of unity. But in my hand, I have an Everton mug. and I've got one as well. And I sent Andrew a special gift with his name on so that he could brush his teeth with it of a morning and swill his mouth out with this wonderful mug that I sent him from Milton Keynes. We have so much in common. He really does. I believe that he has his afternoon tea and biscuits with that mug. So I'm really impressed and blessed. Uh, but I know that uh, the team have been really busy. Andrew's writing uh, a book for uh, the company I work for, uh, which is going to be called Unlocked. And it's all about dealing with isolation uh, and anxiety in these times. Uh, Andrew's been busy starting to write that and uh, we're looking forward to releasing that in a few weeks time just to help people through this uh, virus issue and all of the fear and anxiety that they're facing. Uh, he's also going to be doing a new book. Well, he's finished that, uh, this other new book, which is coming out in September called The Glory Zone in the War Zone. Don't you want to read that book? You have to nod your head so I can see you. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew will sell you plenty of copies at, 45 pounds a copy just to help him through these times. Uh, but I, I'm joking. Um, no. Our relationship with Andrew and Esther and Dan has just gone through the roof. And it's, it's a pleasure uh, to have Andrew to uh, address us all tonight. Uh, and uh, I just want to hand over to him. He has a, a, a free reign as long as he doesn't skip Everton. If he does, I'll mute him so that you can't be heard by anyone. Uh, but uh, uh, we bless you. We just hand over to you, Andrew. Uh, you've got as much time as you need, and then we'll hand back and, and take it from there. I've got my Everton map. It's really wonderful to be with you all tonight. And thank you, Bill and everybody, for inviting me to come along. It's quite bold of you to invite some unknown man to your group, but it's a real honor and privilege to come to your Milton Keynes Supernatural Life team. And I loved your worship being led to this evening by two incredible people. Now, for those of you who don't know me, which is most of you, my name is Canon Andrew White. That means I'm a big shot or a loose cannon. You can take a pick. And I started my life working in the medical world. I was originally um, a gas man, an anesthesiologist. And I used to work on the very ward where Bill Johnson, not Bill Johnson, Boris Johnson now is. And it's um, funny to be here at a time when everybody's thinking about my old place of learning. But for all of you, this is your new place of learning. We are in a supernatural period. Did you know that today was Passover? And we are in a plague. There has never been a plague like the plague we're going through now. 
And God is saying he wants to supernaturally come. And he actually wants to bring life. And the thing which has really amazed me in this time, I was basically told to go home from Israel and Jordan, and I had no desire to. I got home here and I couldn't do any speaking or preaching because every church was closed. But since every church has been closed, the opportunities for the gospel have come alive. God is not stuck in a church anymore. He's out there in this land of plague and he is bringing hope now tonight we've got a very key message it's really finding god in lockdown and we are in lockdown and we know that god is here in a unique way and all of us are to be part of God reaching out. I have many stories myself of being in lockdown. I spent uh, many years working in the Middle East, first in Israel and the West Bank, and then 19 years in. Um, Iraq. But it was whilst I was in Bethlehem that I had my first experience of being in real lockdown. I can never forget the day that I was ill in hospital. And I had a call from Yasser Arafat, do you remember him? And he said, Andrew, Andrew, I need you quickly. I said, why? He said, they've taken my church. I said, you don't have a church, President Arafat. He said, I do, the one where Jesus was born. He said, they've taken it and I need you to get it back me. The church and nativity had been taken over by terrorists and he was convinced that I would get his church back for him. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I then had the then Archbishop of Canterbury phone me and say, Andrew, you've got to get the church and nativity back for them. So I discharged myself from hospital, got on the plane, and the next thing I knew, I was in Bethlehem negotiating the siege at the church in Nativity. It was quite amazing that time. That was really my big introduction to supernatural ministry. But it started with taking risks. I always used to say, don't take care, take risks. But at the moment, you've got to take care. You've got to obey all the governmental warnings about seclusion and washing your hands and washing your hands and washing your hands. That's all we do now, isn't it? Wash our hands. Anyway, I went there. And I knew that God had told me to go there. All of us, in whatever situation we're in today, are going to be asked by God to do something that Others might think we're crazy to do. And we have to be 
willing to begin by saying, Lord, Lord, if this is your will, show me. And one of the ways that we always know God's will is by testing it with our fellow brother and sister Christians. We go to each other and say, I feel God is saying, I should go here. Do you think that's right? It was quite interesting because when I was first contacted by Yasser Arafat, I really didn't feel that it was right to just take advice from some well-known Palestinian terrorist. Generally speaking, you don't do that. And I really felt that God would show me the way. And within the next 10 minutes, I had the foreign minister of Israel and the Archbishop of Canterbury tell me they wanted me to go. So I went to Bethlehem and I can remember being stuck in a place which was under lockdown and I can remember one of the first things I experienced was being in my hotel room and suddenly I had for the first time ever an experience of gold dust, of gold and silver leaves appearing all over. And it was like God saying, this is because you're where I have called you to be. The British ambassador called me in the next day and said, Andrew, there's a man who's very ill in Manger Square in Bethlehem. Now, we need to get somebody to treat him. You're the only guy who's around who's a doctor and has access almost everywhere. I went to get into Beth Bethlehem and for the first time I met a kosher Israeli commander and you'll never guess what his name was. It was Colonel Shmuley Hamburger. So I said, Colonel Hamburger, I've got to go in. This man is very, very ill. I've got some special intravenous medicines I've got to give him. He said, Andrew, you cannot go in today. It's so dangerous. If you went in today, you'd be killed. I said, no, I have to go. He said, well, we're on total lockdown. Just like the words of today, you can't go in. So I never take no very easily. So I drove around a back way to a hidden entrance to Bethlehem. My car couldn't go in, so I had no car. And I walked over these hills and I tried to find a taxi. There were no taxis. Bethlehem was under total curfew. Then I just so happened to see a man with a car. And I said, is there any way you could drive me into Manger Square? And he said, no, it's far too dangerous. I said, is there any way if I paid you some money? How much? 
Anyway, we did a little deal and he got me in. I got in and I found this man who was so ill. He had recently had cardiac surgery in Jordan and he had an infected wound and he needed to have intravenous antibiotics. It just so happened that I had everything I needed in my backpack. It's quite funny what you find in your backpack when you need it. So I started treating him. I was just getting him sorted out and who should turn up at the door? Shmooly Hamburger! What on earth are you doing in here, Keller White? How did you get in? I said, I have another way. Well, he said, you haven't got another way to get out. You've got to go now. So I finished doing what I had to do. And it was quite funny because the colonel's assistant became my drip stand. I needed somebody to hold up his intravenous solution. And he did that. Anyway, once we'd done all that, he said, you're going in your car now and I'm going to drive you very slowly out of Bethlehem. You've got to stay behind my armed vehicle. And for security's sake, we're going very slow. He said, I know it's strange, but that's what we're doing. Anyway, I've got my unknown driver who just turned up and took me to Manger Square. I've still got him. And he agrees to drive me out very, very slowly behind this colonel. Suddenly, in Arabic, we have a term which is mahabal. He was really, really crazy. He just put his foot down after going really slowly and just shot away. He was easily doing well over a hundred kilometers an hour. Shmuley Hamburger gets on the phone. He says, Kanamai, what are you doing? You'll kill yourself. Come back quickly. We're coming to get you. So my unknown driver was zooming me and he went round these back roads. Colonel Hamburger said, meet me at the de de um, depot control office, the head of the Israeli Defense Force in the West Bank. So we drove away down our strange route. We got near there and Shmuley Hamburger came up to me and he gave me a huge hug. I said, I thought you were going to tell me off and shout at me. He said, oh no. He said, the minute that you left us, with that strange Palestinian driver who whisked you away, we had a huge bomb go off just behind us. If you had stayed, you would have been killed immediately. I'm hugging you because I'm so pleased you're alive. And that was a typical example of the supernatural might of the Almighty taking me when wise humanity didn't want me to be.
there's that wonderful passage in um, what is that Acts? In Acts four, where Paul talks about sorry in Ephesians four, where Paul talks about people being caught in captivity almost like Samson and Jesus supernaturally led me into safety by putting me in a completely different way and Jesus will do that with us and all of us who are called to a school of supernatural leadership have to be aware that we must be prepared to be led by our Lord in supernatural ways. And he will. After being in that period in the Bethlehem siege, it was quite funny. It took 39 days to break that siege and get out of it. I hope this doesn't take 39 days. I thought that would be the longest I would ever be in siege for. But after Israel Palestine, I went to Baghdad. And I found myself in even worse situations there. I found myself where we were in kind of lockdown for years. I can remember being literally in lockdown in a kidnap room for a while until God supernaturally release me. You see, there are restrictions which are given by the Holy Spirit, and there are restrictions given by the enemy. But where we know we are living in the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit, we know that His power will reign. I can think of my time in Baghdad and the miracles we saw there. I never forget one day when a Muslim man came to my church. Every church I've ever had, I've also had a clinic attached to it. And he came to the clinic and he said, Abuna, which is my Arabic name, Will you help my daughter? She's dying in hospital. I need her to be treated by your English clinic. I said, my English clinic is all Iraqi. All our doctors are Iraqi. And the most important thing is that your daughter is in the good Iraqi university hospital. And he said, no, I want you to treat her. I said, look, Ibrahim, you come to me. And I prayed with him. And I said, God will heal your daughter. I said to him, I want you to go back to her now in hospital. And keep saying the name of Jesus. In Aramaic, we say Yeshua, not Yeshua, Yeshua. Say Yeshua, Yeshua, Yeshua. He got there saying Yeshua all the way. And when he got there, he was told his daughter was really ill. And that we think she's going to die. And eventually the doctor came out and said, she's died now. He cried and cried and cried. And he said, but the Abuna said that she was going to get well. 
Still crying, he went into the ward. She had been placed under covers. And he just ran over to her and hugged her. And he kept saying, Yeshua, Yeshua, Yeshua. And suddenly, she sat up. And she said, Daddy, I'm hungry. Can I have some food? And when he told me this, I said, don't worry, Abraham, it's happened before. A wonderful example of the supernatural power of God. I can think of, I had quite a few resurrection stories. But that's all for now. I'll tell you more another time if I'm invited back. But another night, I was sitting in the Palestine Hotel, which was just the name of one of the hotels, but it was looking over the Tigris River, as you do. And I saw this huge cloud over the Tigris. And I said to God, that looks like a glory cloud. And I said, what is it, Lord? And yes, he said, it's a glory. It is a glory. And that day, I saw new miracles beginning to happen. I never forget one of them. Was the next morning, somebody came down to me. The Ayatollah the previous day had said, Andrew, we need you to help us. We've got no food. It's just after the war and all our people are starving. Have you got money for any food? I said, I've got $12, that's all. He said, but you can pray. You've got God. Now, when an Ayatollah tells you to pray, you do. And you expect God to answer big time. So that night, after I'd seen the glory cloud, I prayed, Lord, give me some food. I went down to breakfast the next day, and a big man comes up to me, an American soldier. He goes, hey, Father. You're a priest, aren't you? Do you want some food? I said, what do you mean, do I want some food? He said, I've got some food. I said, how much food have you got? He said, I've got, can't remember, hundreds of thousands of tons of meat. So he said, would you like it? I said, yeah, I'll have it. And only later that day did I realize that God had actually answered my prayer. I'd been given thousands or millions of tons of meat. And this man's name was Andy as well. And I then called him Andy the Meat Man. And he was in the American Army. And I said to him, where on earth did you get all this meat from? He said, this was all meant for the American Army. But the paperwork was wrong. 
So they told me to get rid of it. And that's a wonderful example of God providing in ways you least expect. It. Who would have thought that that food for the Iraqis would have come by the American army? I used to, when I was in Baghdad in those days, every morning I used to go down to the bank of the Tigris and do my morning praying until it got a little bit difficult because there were always bodies bobbing up and down in the water. But that was an incredible time of seeing the miraculous work of God. So many times God spoke to me there and met needs which I wouldn't have thought were possible to me. I think of another day um, when it was actually after I'd seen the glory cloud. I said to the Lord, well, what's significant? How can I found, find out about the glory in over the Tigris? And he said to me, read the book of Ezekiel. And I didn't realize it was 48 chapters and it took a long time. And I read it, and then afterwards, I thought, wow, I want to go and see Ezekiel Shrine. Now, I'm quite a Pentecostal Anglican. I'm not into going to shrines and things. I asked all of my team and staff, where is Ezekiel's shrine? Where is his tomb? And nobody could tell me. So I looked it up on Google. And I found that it was in a place called Kifu, which comes from Yaskil. And there was a place called Kifu, which was right next to Babylon. The real Babylon the hanging gardens of Babylon, which Saddam had had done up as a palace for himself. I asked everybody, how was I going to get to Babylon? And nobody knew how we were going to do it. And then suddenly, one of my Iraqi friends, who just happened to be a general called George Sada, he agreed, I will try and take you there. And we drove all the way to Babylon and asked people, where is the Ezekiel shrine? And nobody could tell us. And in the end, we got caught in the biggest traffic jam of my life. And it was all donkeys. It was a donkey traffic jam on Friday. Whatever you do, you do not want to be caught in a donkey traffic jam on a Friday. It's very bad. Anyway, we got there, and I was caught by all these donkeys, and finally they led us to this shrine. And here was the tomb of the real Yeheskel, Kifel, Ezekiel. And I went in there and I saw angels. And I went into the courtyard and there in the sky were these spinning wheels, just like in Ezekiel. And that was my first real experience of seeing the supernatural power of God. 
It changed my life. And even though I was in Baghdad many years after that, on Wednesdays, I would also always go to that old oriental synagogue, now turned into a Shiite mosque, because I always knew that I'd meet with the supernatural power of God in that place. And I would always see prayers answered in a big way. And so that was one of the very great examples of really learning about the supernatural power of the Almighty. Any questions? Andrew, I think, I think it would be wonderful if you could pray over everyone who's with us tonight to see, begin to see and experience some of the things that you've experienced, uh, that provision and miracles and seeing uh, things that we've never seen before that are supernatural. Uh, would you uh, pray and impart that blessing on us as we we pray with you. I will pray, but I want to pray at the end of me talking. Mm. I haven't finished yet. <laughs> because you gave me a bit longer, didn't you? I was very generous. Now, um, I do want to pray with you because I know that God wants all of us, including your people in your leadership school, all of us to experience the real supernatural power of God. I can remember a few years later in my church in Baghdad, after some of my other children had been killed, terribly killed, their heads chopped off by the precursor to ISIS. And I was crying and crying and crying. And the other children came to me the next morning. They called me daddy. They said, daddy, we know you've been crying. But last night when we were asleep, both of us, this was Maha and Rita, we had a dream. And in our dream, all of the children who got killed were dancing with Jesus in heaven. We know they're right. They're dancing with Jesus in heaven. And you see, that was the, just one of my very angelic, real visitations and meetings. And I can remember another time when there was an old blind man called Abu Yusuf. And we had been given some of those mega boys speaking Bibles. And I gave one of them to him. And he had been able to listen to the whole of the Bible. And he said his whole life changed when the word suddenly became real in his presence. And so... Each of you now must cry out to God and say, come now, Lord. Come in our lockdown situation. Come and bring your power. Shall we pray? Lord God, we thank you that you are here with us now. Mm. We thank you 
that you are the God of power in lockdown. You are the God of liberation when there appears just to be restraint. That you are the God of giving fulfillment when we appear to have nothing. Come amongst all of my brothers and sisters who are worshipping and studying and leaning on you, Lord, now. Come now in your power. Come now in your spirit. For the Lord is here. The Lord is in lockdown with us. And he has given us his freedom, his power, his glory. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. So what we need to do now is ask the question, how can we pre create a place of encounter in Milton Keynes? I'm just going to hand back to Andrew. Andrew's just got some more things that he wants to say to us. And we'll be finished uh, uh, probably by uh, 9.45. So uh, hand straight back over to Andrew. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you so much, Bill. I think the question that we all need to ask ourselves now is how can we create a place of encounter in Milton Keynes? How can we place, um, establish a place of supernatural encounter? And in all that we do in the power of the Spirit, we have got to begin with worship. And that's why it is wonderful that you have got two great people leading us in worship. At the beginning, at the end, and we're just waiting for more. You see, we are surrounded by walls like the walls of Jericho. And they fill an invisible space. And we've got to break through these walls like Jehoshaphat in two chronicles. We've got to work at this freedom in confinement. Look at Paul and Silas how they worshipped in prison and they got out. Worship is so powerful. We have to sing in the spirit and every single day speak to our Lord in our heavenly language. And we've got to live in the word of God. The scripture has to be the thing which sets us on fire. And then we've got to spend time soaking in the presence of God. Just as Samuel laid before the ark in 1 Samuel. We've got to be like Joshua who stayed in the tabernacle when Moses left and lingered in God's presence. We've got to allow him, the Almighty, to fill us to overflowing with his refreshing water. We need to be like a sponge of resources with knowledge of his will. And we need to be still in the presence of God. 
we need to seriously meditate and we need to contemplate and we need to reflect on the might of God. Psalm 46, isn't it, that says, Be still and know that I am God. In these moments when we are still, more revelation comes. We enter a new level of gratitude and appreciation for all he has done, all he is. Visions are birthed, ideas are formulated, truth is imparted because we are able to receive. We are still in the place of incubation. We learn to meditate like David, to inquire of the Lord and seek counsel, to read the Psalms and follow David's examples in fixing our gaze on him alone. Fill your image center with him. Watch biblical movies and spirit film, spirit filled media shows. And we can never forget the centrality of holy communion with God. Cultivate a friendship with God. Become more aware of his holy presence. We can feel him when we just stop and think you are here your holy spirit is with us and moving into the power of the living god through the supernatural gift of tongues is so essential we've got to really Learn to be a people of prayer, to release God's grace over our group. We need fresh revelation, fresh encounter, and fresh vision. And you will get it now in your groups because you're in the right place. And God is saying, here I am, take me. Thank you, Jesus, we take you. And I pray for you all now. Heavenly Father, in all of our groups, in whatever we're doing, we thank you that you are here. Your Holy Spirit is with us. You are inspiring us. You are reviving us. You are sending us to be on fire people. We don't know what you're going to do. But what we do know is that it's going to be great. Mm. Here we are in this time of, time of so-called lockdown. And it's a time of lockdown for the spirit of the living God. We are in a unique supernatural experience. And all our Lord says to us is what he said to Isaiah. Here I am, wholly available. 
take me. Thank you, Lord. We are not alone. We are with you. We are inspired by you. And you are speaking to us now. Oh, Shyan Lakabasunda, Yan Lakabasunda. Oh, Suya Lakabasian Lakabasunda. Oh, Sian Lakabasunda, Yan Lakabasunda, Yan Lakabasunda, Yan Oh, Shyan Lakabasianda. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. Freedom in confinement. Uh, my theology's changed tonight because when you were in small groups, we were just talking our group. And I would suggest that we actually put the word isolation away. And, uh, I'm actually not isolated because God is with me. And my wife here is with me and you folks are here with me, even though we're not present in a big room. So maybe there's something in there with the word isolation and just use confinement. Um, it's just a softer, softer thing. Uh, we're going to go out with this song, The Blessing, but I just want to tell you what I did this week. Uh, I took Richard's advice and tried to call people just to encourage them and see how they are. While I was praying the other morning and Jackie sent this video through and I'd seen it once or twice before, I decided to send it to my sisters. Uh, and my sisters uh, aren't Christians and they're, you know, their wider families aren't either. Uh, but I sent it to them uh, just as on messenger as a, a blessing to them and just said, hey, you know what? I'm praying this over you, my sister and your husband and the children. And my sisters just came back and said, that is probably the most beautiful thing that we've had sent to us in these difficult times. And my sisters are on furlough with the companies that they work for. So um, it's pretty hard. But I think there's a great blessing in this song. So as we go out, uh, I think Anne shared the link with the song. You might want to just take the, uh, uh, the song and send it to some family members and just pray a blessing over them uh, this Easter, just release a blessing on their households wherever wherever they are. So uh, Paul and Jackie are just going to lead us in this song as we, as we close out. And I appreciate uh, you coping with us all tonight, technology and everything else. But let, let's sing this song together and then we'll go and rest up for the night. Oh.
He is for you, 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 he is for you,